Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Jen Beagle, Director General of the International Development Law Organization. A warm welcome to you all. It is a pleasure to open this event on eliminating discriminatory laws, achieving gender equality on paper and in practice during challenging times. I would like to thank our partners, the Permanent Mission of the Philippines to the United Nations, the World Bank, and the International Fund for Agricultural Development. I'm speaking to you from Rome, the headquarters of IDLO. It is a pity that we could not meet in person, but every cloud has a silver lining, and I am pleased that so many have joined us from around the globe. I'm also delighted to have two excellent and distinguished panels with us today. We could not have a better group of people to discuss such a critical issue. Since 1979, 189 states have ratified CEDAW and its call to condemn and eradicate all discrimination against women without delay. But as we know, after several decades, legal barriers continue to hold back women and girls in all regions. According to the World Bank, on average, women have only three quarters of the legal rights afforded to men globally. In some countries, women are still legally required to secure the consent of their husband or male relatives to sign a contract, start a business, or obtain a passport. Laws continue to deny women the right to pass their nationality to their children or assume that husbands and fathers are heads of families. In more than 50 countries, women's freedom of movement is restricted. In nearly 90 countries, women are prevented from entering certain professions. And only 42% of countries grant women equal rights to own property in law and in practice. In total, discriminatory laws and policies affect a staggering 2.5 billion women and girls around the world. The impact of pre-existing legal inequality is now being exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. IDLO's report, Justice for Women Amidst COVID-19, developed with partners including UN Women, UNODC, UNDP, the World Bank, the Pathfinders and the Elders, shows how despite women's enormous contributions to mitigating the impact of the pandemic, the crisis is threatening to roll back decades of hard-won gains on gender equality. For instance, women are more likely to work in sectors such as hospitality, tourism, and small-scale agriculture that are often lightly regulated or ignored by the law, offering little job security or protection from the economic fallout of the crisis. Coupled with the increased burden of unpaid childcare and domestic work, which has fallen largely on women and girls, this means that women's employment has been disproportionately affected. Data from around the world shows that a record number of women are dropping out of the labor force with working mothers hardest hit. Or take discriminatory laws around property ownership and inheritance. In many countries, widows, daughters, and divorced women are barred in law or in practice from claiming their ownership rights in the case of death or dissolution of marriage. Upon the death of a spouse in these countries, women typically lose access to and control over property. For many women, the home is also their place of work, meaning that the death of a husband or father during the pandemic directly impacts women's right to housing, shelter, and security for themselves and their children. Discriminatory laws not only violate human rights, but hold back the development potential of countries around the world by limiting the contribution women and girls can make. In 2019, OECD estimated that the annual output losses associated with current levels of gender discrimination are at up to 12 trillion US dollars, or 16% of global GDP. So how do we bring about real change and eliminate discriminatory laws around the world? Idea Law works at the intersection of SDG 16 on peace, justice, and inclusion, and SDG 5 on gender equality. Our experience promoting legal reform and gender equality suggests three key elements for success. Firstly, legal reviews are key to identifying discriminatory laws and policies and an important step in the process towards law reform. They require working with law reform commissions, judiciaries, ministries of justice, women's commissions, and parliaments, as well as other stakeholders. Together with UN Women and national partners, 
We're working in countries including the Philippines, Kenya, Mali and Sierra Leone to undertake comprehensive reviews of legislation aimed at repealing discriminatory laws. But this work is not only about repealing discriminatory laws, but also ensuring that they are replaced by policies and institutions that are responsive to women's needs. Secondly, to turn these recommendations into action, there is a need to mobilize political will for change. Research su suggests that the most powerful force driving progressive policy change on gender-based violence has been feminist action and women's rights movements. Women's groups are uniquely placed to play a transformational role in advancing law reform by educating women and girls about their rights, encouraging participation, and fostering the political impetus for change. We must build strong multi-stakeholder coalitions for change across societies and make men and boys partners in the effort to achieve gender equality. The third and final part is strengthening national institutions so they have the capacity to implement change, coupled with measures which allow women to claim and enforce their rights. It is also crucial that law reforms are combined with investment in areas which matter to women most, including family courts, legal aid for family proceedings, and small claims tribunals. IDLO has partnered with national institutions in Kenya, for example, over the last decade to support the development of gender responsive policies through a combination of technical assistance, capacity building, and implementation support. We are currently supporting the development of laws and policies, including the Children's Bill, matrimonial policy rules, and the judiciary gender policy, to name just a few. All these three elements are essential in ensuring gender equality is achieved, not just on paper, but also in practice. While the challenge ahead may seem vast, history shows us that the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice, and that with enough determination, even the most entrenched discrimination can be overturned. I would like to end with a quote from the Egyptian feminist and writer, Nawal El Sadawi, who passed away earlier this week. She said, solidarity between women can be a powerful force of change and can influence future development in ways favorable not only to women, but also to men. There is huge scope for us to learn from experiences and expertise across the world and to use this knowledge as a catalyst for change in more and more countries. It is in this spirit of both urgency and optimism that I look forward to the panel discussion. I'm pleased to hand over to our moderator, Ilaria. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Director General Jan Beagle for your insightful comments and uh, welcome everyone to today's webinar on eliminating discriminatory laws achieving gender equality on paper and in practice during challenging times. Uh, my name is Ilaria Bottigliero. I'm the Director of Research and Learning at IDLO, and it's a real honor and a pleasure to be your moderator today for this important panel where we would look at some uh, key questions uh, in um, uh, achieving gender equality. We have together with us, a very distinguished panel of, uh, of speakers that will help us um, understand better and reflect on uh, a number of important issues. First of all, we're going to take a look at which laws require immediate reform or uh, prioritization, especially in light of COVID-19. We will then try to understand what are the promising, if any, approaches to expand political will and support for the elimination of discriminatory laws and uh, of course for the adoption of more gender equal ones. And we will then uh, try to reflect on the issue of opportunities that are available to us, to the international community in the short and long term to bring about urgent commitment, action and resources to this area of work. Now, but before uh, getting into the core, the heart of the discussion, uh, let me share with you a few uh, very basic housekeeping rules uh, that are typical of the Zoom platform that we are using today. 
First of all, um, I would like to share with you that this webinar will be recorded and that um, will be also broadcasted live on Facebook. So we are currently on Facebook Live and we are also on the UN Web TV. The recording of the webinar will be available on IDLO's webinar following the end of the event. Uh, so you will find it on our website. As usual, we also have um, an open chat and I can see that uh, the chat is already very lively. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many of you. I see uh, colleagues from uh, Rwanda, Kuwait, uh, I see colleagues from Texas, Nigeria, uh, Moldova. So we have a very, very a global audience today. So thank you so much for following us and please continue sharing your messages and interacting on the chat that you have on your right hand side. You will also have a chance to uh, pose questions to our panelists. We have two sets of uh, speakers today. And after each one of the two panels, we'll have a dedicated time for question and answers. So please um, uh, continue to pose your questions through the Q&A um, box that you have on your screens. And uh, our gender team uh, will moderate the Q&A um, uh, sessions and will gather your questions that I will then in turn pose to our uh, distinguished speakers. But it is now uh, time for us to uh, move and inter introduce our uh, speakers of today. So for the first uh, panel, uh, I'm very, very pleased to have uh, with us today um, uh, Mr. Trumbic, who is a program manager of Women, Business and the Law at the World Bank. We also have Ms. Anita Balida, who is the Chief Gender and Development Specialist of the Philippine Commission on Women. And we are waiting to establish a connection with Her Excellency Hosna Jalil, the Deputy Minister for Women's Affairs of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, uh, who is having um, a few challenges at the moment connecting, but she will be with us as soon as possible. So without further ado, let's get into the core of the discussions and I'm going to give the floor to Ms. Thea Trumbic of the World Bank. Thea, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. And thank you, Laria, for this nice introduction. Um, before I begin, I also I wanted to thank the organizers and to IDLO, IFAD, and the government of the Philippines for co-sponsoring this session with us. And I also want to thank the contributors who contribute to Women, Business, and the Law Report, without whom we would not be able to do this research. So if any of them are participating and watching this later, a big thank you to you as well. Unfortunately, this last year has been very difficult and we have been seeing sad news every day. Women have been disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. They've had to leave their jobs to take care of their families and because they get sick, they tend to work in jobs that do not offer equal pay or adequate social protection. But we believe that laws that encourage equal economic inclusion can make societies more resilient. And this has been so much more the case now during the pandemic. No country can achieve its full potential without the equal participation of both men and women. Establishing equal opportunities in the law makes economic sense, but it is also a matter of dignity and human rights. Achieving gender equality requires a determined effort of all parts of society, but laws are a foundational first step. Unfortunately, all over the world, women continue to be at a disadvantage. Discriminatory laws are holding women back from reaching their full potential, threatening their economic security, but also that of their communities and countries. That is why at Women, Business and the Law, we set out to identify where exactly laws are preventing women from working and running successful businesses. Over the last 12 years, Women, Business and the Law has presented a data set that measures progress towards gender equality in the law in that 190 economies. We examine how the law treats women when it comes to freedom of movement, to those that prohibit discrimination and sexual harassment in the workplace, 
to laws affecting women's pay and their rights when they get married and have children. We also measure women's constraints to starting and running businesses, to different treatment of women when it comes to managing and inheriting property, and all the way to laws affecting the size of a woman's pension. Our data identifies where discriminatory laws persist in these eight different areas, affecting different stages of women's professional lives and highlighting opportunities for reform. This research builds evidence on the critical link between gender equality and economic growth. We know more today about the importance of equality than we used to, but there is more work to do to fully reap its benefits. Women Business in the Law 2021 report, which was just released at the end of February, shows that globally the average woman has just three-fourths of the legal rights of the average man. If we average out the scores of all the countries we measure, the global average score is 76.1 out of a total of 100. Let me share some of the reasons why women are still disadvantaged by laws around the world. In 88 countries, women cannot do the same jobs as men. And these are jobs in transport, transport, manufacturing, construction, water, energy, or mining, which often tend to pay more. And even in those countries where women can do the same jobs as men, they're paid less. In 100 countries, it is legally acceptable to pay women less for equally valued jobs. But there are other constraints that keep women from reaching their full potentials. In 38 countries, a woman can still be fired just because she's pregnant. And although more than half of the countries measured have now mandated some form of paid leave for fathers, the median duration is just one week. Only 44 economies have paid parental leave. Women cannot achieve equality in the workplace until they are, while they are on unequal footing at home. And they cannot contribute fully if they are not free from harassment and violence. Where women are legally protected from sexual harassment, more women have been found to own businesses. But 49 economies globally do not have laws on sexual harassment in the workplace. And 35 countries still do not have laws on domestic violence at, at home. In fact, 95% of our sample a total of 180 countries still have at least one legal barrier that puts women on unequal footing with men. And the pandemic has worsened these existing inequalities that disadvantage women, leaving them economically insecure and threatening their health and safety. With 740 million women globally in informal employment and a majority employed in services, women are particularly hard hit by the crisis. Women face lost opportunities and reduced financial independence due to school closures and increased unpaid family care responsibilities. And they have a heightened risk of disease exposure due to their role as caregivers and health workers. And this crisis unfortunately is also very regressive and women make up a large share of the world's poor. So there's a real concern that we will see setbacks on the gains made over the last few decades when it comes to gender equality. This is why it's more important than ever to reform laws and achieve greater, greater gender equality. And this should remain a priority as governments enact measures to recover from the shocks imposed by this crisis. I will conclude by saying that we need to prioritize reforming the following laws. Repealing all discriminatory laws that prevent women from working and running businesses in the same way as men. Enacting laws that mandate equal pay and prohibit discrimination at work and in access to finance. Enact laws that protect women's jobs when they have children and guarantee paid parental leave so that the burden of raising children is shared between men and women from the very beginning. And finally, laws that prohibit sexual harassment and violence against women. Women need to feel safe at home, at work, and all the places in between. Thank you. Back to you, Laria. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your for your comments and uh, a special uh, thank you for uh, having done such great research. Uh, it is uh, of essential value for all of us that work uh, in development in the legal profession to have solid data to uh, focus our interventions where uh, is most they are most needed. So the research that uh, Women Business and the Law is conducting is absolutely essential. And by sharing these figures with us, you have really shown the magnitude of, of, the, pro of the problem. And uh, I am sure there will be many follow-up questions from our audience to understand better where uh, 
support is needed and what are the areas that need more uh, focus uh, in order to make a change. So thank you very much, uh, Thea, for, for your insight. So let me now give the floor to uh, Ms. Anita Baleda of the Philippine Commission on Women. Uh, Ms. Baleda, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening here in the Philippines. COVID-19 has brought about great challenges and has contributed to gender inequalities in the Philippines. As the crisis continues and the country grapples with the new normal, the impacts of emerging issues and concerns on women and girls have worsened. These issues include sexual and reproductive health, gender-based violence, and unpaid care work. Amending existing laws or enactment of new ones are necessary to address these issues. On sexual and reproductive health, even before the global pandemic, there has been a need to address health-related issues and concerns of women and girls, including their access to sexual and reproductive health services. Because of COVID-19, the government has reallocated its resources and reprioritized its programs and this has adversely affected women's access to sexual and reproductive health services and commodities. The pandemic has disrupted, among others, access to family planning commodities, prenatal and maternal health care services. With maternal mortality remaining an issue in the Philippines, recent data revealed an even, an even alarming issue on the increase in teenage pregnancy. With the pandemic and without state intervention on laws and policies, a dramatic increase in maternal mortality and morbidity and adolescent pregnancies is expected. Recognizing the challenges in implementing the existing laws on reproductive health, it is important to push for an mandatory law that will allow young women and girls who are already mothers and those who are pregnant to avail of reproductive health services. A new law to curb teenage pregnancy and provide comprehensive sexual, sexuality education to Filipino youth is very necessary. On gender-based violence, um, this second issue uh, requires immediate policy reform or prioritization. And this is on um, gender-based violence, which has increased globally and with the implementation, given the implementation of lockdown measures. An alarming concern related to gender-based violence in the Philippines during the pandemic is the proliferation of online sexual abuse and exploitation of children. Compounded with a long and restrictive lockdown and high poverty incidence in the country, cases of online sexual abuse of children have aggravated undetectably and swiftly with more than 200% increase in 2020 during the enhancement and uh, during the enhanced community quarantine. These issues coupled with the complex trauma that survivors of online sexual abuse experience require an appropriate and holistic set of care options that address the needs of survivors and reduce the likelihood of re-victimization. The effect of online sexual abuse on victims has far reaching cons consequence because once a material is shared online, you know, it is um, almost impossible to control its distribution. More importantly, this continuum of sexual violence intensifies the distress, shame, guilt, and anger of child victims that their pictures or videos remain online where they can be viewed by their friends and relatives. Given the ubiquity of the internet and the severity of the effects of the crime, the immediate passage of legislative measures to provide for the protection of the rights and dignity of girls and boys against the proliferation of online sexual abuse is highly recommended. On unpaid care work, which is the last issue I'm going to highlight, is, um, this has increased tremendously during the COVID-19 pandemic. Unpaid care work, which includes, among others, household chores and responsibilities such as on online homeschooling of children, preparing meals, cleaning the house, taking care of the sick or elderly family members. Responsibilities, which oftentimes fall automatically on the lap of women due to prevailing societal norms and culture. 
Oxfam International reports that prior to COVID-19, women and girls spend up to 11 hours a day on unpaid care work, which is three to four times more than that of men and boys. But women's unpaid care and domestic work has remained unrecognized and unvalued, even if it has great economic and social value. According to a study here in the Philippines in 2019, unpaid care work is estimated to be worth at least 40 billion US dollars or roughly 20% of the Philippines GDP. The study also highlighted the potential non-monetary contributions of care work um, is said to go beyond financial valuation, such as child schooling outcomes, which suggests that home production activities are actually investments towards a higher quality household. Considering this, it is important to review policies and programs that could address gender issues in unpaid care work and how this affect the achievement of gender equality and women's empowerment including economic empowerment and women's participation and leadership in society. Existing laws should be examined and enhanced. The daycare center law, for example, could include provision of child minding centers in the workplace. The telecommuting act could, incl could include other forms of flexible work arrangements, especially for those with young children. The expanded maternity leave law, which uh, should also look into if possible increasing of paternity paid leave on top of the maternity leave that is an, an option to be shared to husbands or partners. It is also important to come up with legislative measures that will recognize, reduce, and redistribute the burden of unpaid care work using a whole of society approach. Without gender responsive policies, we risk derailing hard won gains on gender equality. Hence, immediate action is necessary as we aim for a sustainable and resilient recovery from this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Baleda, for, for your comments. Uh, it is extremely important, and I'm sure uh, the issue will come up again during the discussion to recognize um, unpaid work for women. It is such a major element in not only women's economic empowerment, but also in ensuring gender equality and the figures that you share with us are really shocking. Um, you also highlighted the area of gender-based violence and domestic violence, something that we know uh, it's of a real concern during COVID-19. Uh, everybody's aware, figures went up up dramatically, so it's something that we will again uh, focus on in terms of how can we act from the uh, legal perspective, from uh, the, the legislative perspective to make these changes long lasting uh, in, in our parliaments and, and in our societies. But let's continue with, uh, with our discussion. I uh, can see now that uh, fortunately uh, Her Excellency Hosna Jalil was able to connect. So um, uh, welcome Her Excellency, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, the Deputy Minister for Women's Affairs of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Welcome again, thank you for connecting today and the floor is yours. Your microphone, uh, please uh, unmute. There we go. I'm sorry, I keep uh, uh, forgetting to unmute myself. It's such a great pleasure uh, being here today among all of you. Thank you so much for having me along with other great uh, panelists um, and this event. Uh, and I'm so sorry for not being able to join during my own session because I am getting connected with you from one of the Afghanistan provinces. I'm, I'm coming from one province to the other. So. Um, and I think I am actually bringing my today's experience of gender equality as well. So I wanted to add that to my remark too, at the provincial level. Uh, so I'll be speaking about the uh, gender equality on paper and in practice, which are uh, mostly different. Like what we practice is not all the time aligned with our papers because the papers looks fancy and ideal most of the times. 
Uh, so I'll be touching mainly on the gender equality, gender equity, and the uh, violation against women, which is very much uh, connected to the to the above to to the to both topics that I mentioned. What do we have on paper and what do we have in practice on paper? Afghanistan is one of the countries that I would say which has the I can't say best or I can't say ideal, but is, is having a great legal foundation when it comes to gender equality at the same time when it comes to uh, um, the equal rights of women and men in Afghanistan. Starting from the constitutional law of the country up to the uh, most of the um, policy papers that we have, even the policy foundation, I would say. All of them are focusing so much on the, or are heavily focusing on uh, provision of equal rights to men and women. And those rights include access to services, access to resources, their participation, their partnership in each any of the uh, sectors across the country. But what we have on practice, that is a little bit different because um, practice is, is not, uh, of course, affected only based on the um, legal framework or the policy frameworks we have, it also is connected to the very soft side of the society and those are mentalities, culture, uh, traditions, and all of them are uh, in a way, I would say directly or indirectly affecting the uh, overall I mean, uh, process in practice. So what we have in terms of gender equality uh, and the, of course, the violation against women as well, what we have in practice, we've got the best laws, but they're not 100% uh, implemented. Um, one of the reasons is, um, well, when it comes to the violence against women, uh, because our justice system or the entire justice system, judicial system is not prioritizing violence against women, I mean, violence cases against women. And that is coming from a, a point of view where, where our justice system is, is in a way I can't say dominated, but still the, the traditional or the very conservative mentalities of individuals within that system is affecting the, the uh, performance or the, the uh, I would say the, uh, the actions um, of, of the system. Uh, in the meantime, when it comes to the equality, we do have um, the, as I mentioned, we do have the legal uh, documentations. We do have the policies where we, are mandated at the same time we have to provide equal services, equal uh, access to resources or, or, or as a whole package, uh, equal rights to men and women. But in practice, there are a couple of challenges we have when it comes to having equal uh, access to services and to resources. Uh, I would say because women have never been able to dominate the resource in the country, the, the resources across Afghanistan has always been dominated by men. So they still have the influence over the, um, the resources. Plus, in the last 19 years, when it comes to, um, I mean, we have to have them, their, their partnership, we have to have them, part, I mean, have to have their participation in order to be able to provide services to other women. I mean, it's, it's both very much connected. So we don't have their, I mean, their participation and their uh, partnership is limited to 11% decision making and 28% uh, running the civil service institutions, which is not, of course, helping us in order to provide access to services to other women with a very, I would say, uh, feminine lens, like understanding the needs of other females or working for them dedicated or, uh, I would say, with, with a higher commitment. But in the meantime, we don't have the, I mean, we haven't been able to, like 19 years, I can't say it's enough in order to build the capacity of the 51% of the population of this country. But it, I mean, end of the day, we uh, sometimes in some of the areas, we don't have, um, I would say in some of the provinces, not all the provinces, because in some of the provinces, women are dominating some of the sectors. But in some of the provinces, I would say we still have to work on those capacities in order to be able to bring them within the, uh, decision making or the management of the services and the uh, resources at the decision making at the management level, we have to bring them in order to be able to provide access to services. So that is one of the biggest challenges we have got uh, in terms of uh, equal access to resources. Plus, if we go out of or beyond the um, professional structures or the professional institutions which are mandated to provide equal access to services, we have to go back to the roots of 
provision of access to, uh, I mean, um, uh, provision of equal rights to men and women. That is going back to the society, that's going back to the families. We still have to work with the public at the very local level. We have to work with the mentalities in order to make them understand that women and men are having equal rights. Uh, they're given equal rights. It's, it's not something that the, um, the people are giving them. It is something already given to them. They own these equal rights. But that is something which, are not, which is not believed in the rural areas of Afghanistan. We have to work with those mentalities. Um, either from a very religious perspective, at the same time from a very uh, conventional perspective. Uh, so that, that is one of that that is supposed to be one of the biggest struggles Ministry of Women Affairs should have in the upcoming years. But it's I mean we have a long way to go with that. I can't say how much I mean in terms of the progress. How, I mean how fascinating that progress is in the last uh, two decades, like in the last nineteen years, like how far we have gone when it comes to. Um, I mean, the understanding at the same time, the practice of provision of equal services, equal rights to men and women, but there's a long way to go with it. So what we are doing at the Ministry of Women's Affairs when it comes to, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, um, I mean, when it comes to the government's initiatives in order to provide equal services, equal rights to men and women. The first one is that the Ministry of Women's Affairs is leading the effort, but it's a cross-cutting effort together with Ministry of Religious Affairs, Ministry of um, Education, Ministry of Higher Education, when uh, there are so many other institutions which are involved because this is a cross-cutting topic. We are working together with the public jirgas, with the public shoras at the very local village level, district level, we are working on those mentalities. We are trying to make the women understand what is their rights, but equally to that, we have to make the male side, the men, understand what is the, um, I mean, which rights uh, the women own, like how that is equal to, to a male uh, counterpart. Uh, but in addition to that, we are also, we have initiated this year because uh, all the policies, I can't say they're very much synchronized, the policies across the government, uh, they are scattered. I have to accept that most of these policies are scattered and Ministry of Interior Affairs has not, Ministry of Women Affairs has have not um, reviewed them and aligning them with the overall strategy or the policy of the Ministry of Women's Affairs for, 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 for the women. So this year we, have, we are launching the policy review process where we are reviewing the entire, I mean, any cross policy we have across the government or any commitment we have got across the government to make sure all of them are aligned with that mentality of equal rights and equal access to equal services and resources to the women of Afghanistan. Uh, the other initiative we have uh, taken is uh, when we're talking about the equal rights, uh, we have to go to the worst case scenarios, which is violence. We have to eliminate or we have to tackle, I can't say 100% elimination, but I have to say that we have to decrease this to the minimum possible level, the, the violence against women. So that is one of the areas that we have to work on in order to give them, to, to enable them at least, to understand their, their rights, because violence is mentally is, is um, I would say, making a woman believe that there's no right for me. So uh, that is one of the, I mean, under this package or under the umbrella of gender um, equality or equal rights, the tackling the EVA is one of the biggest priorities. The, the, uh, uh, tackling the violence against women is one of the biggest priorities. So what we're doing for the elimination of violence against women. First, we've got a commission um, in practice. We've got a high commission uh, at the cabinet level for violence against women, for eliminating violence against women. So this year we are trying to strengthen that with two uh, big components to be added to that um, commission. The first one is we are merging it with the, we are bringing actually the harassment commission under the, um, um, uh, the, EVO, the EVO commission. The second one is we are launching a big center, like it's, it's a complaint center for the women where they can um, um, report their, their violence cases, but that uh, center is gonna be semi-independent. It's not gonna be dominated by the government. We will have the Human Rights Commission. At the same time, we will have the civil society. The other one is uh, um, a, a database where they can record. We do have databases across the government, but they're scattered. So we are trying to unify them so that we can work on improving the policies. The other one that we are working on is the support centers, women support centers. 
in Afghanistan, we, and we are expanding the, exp the uh, scope of the centers. In Afghanistan, if I, if I may give you an example, going to a uh, psychologist, uh, I mean, a woman going to a psychologist is a taboo. They can't go. So one of the uh, challenges we have is that we are establishing these social service center and the counseling centers across all the provinces. We are starting it this year, but it's gonna take us a couple of years in order to be able to launch in 34 provinces. But that is one of the centers that can help us in order to both uh, create, I mean, uh, help with the awareness of, of among men and women under the equal rights of men and women plus, uh, it also helps us to provide them services in practice whenever they, they deal with, with some sort of inconveniences in the society, in their workplace, in their families, they can reach out to these centers. So that is how we can help it on, on, on in practice. But overall, if I may conclude uh, my remark with the uh, difference in practice and um, uh, on papers, I would say Afghanistan might be one of the countries where we have, I mean, the best of the best papers. But in practice, we are still struggling. Um, again, I have to repeat myself, the progress we have, it, it's fantastic. The progress we have got in just two decades, it's fantastic. But of course, in order to be able to develop the 50% of Afghanistan's human capital, 51% of Afghanistan's human capital, which are women, in order to rebuild this country, to develop this country, of course, we need to work uh, more than ever for uh, provision of equal rights for, for both women and men in, in Afghanistan. Uh, I think I've received a question from my colleagues. I'll have to check. Thank you, Her, uh, thank you, Her Excellency. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for your comments uh, and your insight today. And we will have um, uh, questions during the question and uh, Q&A time. So I'm sure you will have a chance to uh, respond to questions as well. Um, we were all uh, impressed by your comments. You mentioned that um, you talked about Afghanistan and uh, the, the, the gap between um, uh, laws in theory and implementation in practice, but this is a very widespread problem. So I would say most countries are actually facing a, a, a real gap between what is written and the equality that we all enjoy in law and what happens in practice, inclu including, of course, uh, the influence of cultural norms, religious norms, and uh, uh, discriminatory practices, uh, family situations, etc. So this is one of the uh, biggest problems that we are actually facing uh, globally, worldwide. Um, so thank you very much for your comments. And um, let me uh, immediately go into the discussions. There are so many questions that are coming through our, our chat and our uh, Q&A chat. So it will be a bit difficult to manage the time, but let's try to get them through as many uh, as possible. Um, I actually have an interesting question related to um, women's participation in uh, decision-making uh, processes. We have a a, a participant, uh, Rosemary Chosi Nam from Guyana, who is asking an interesting question um, about the, the participation of women in legal commissions reviewing laws. Uh, it's a bit of a, um, a, a rhetorical question if you want, how many women sit on these commissions to make gender equality a reality? And this really links, you know, we had an event last week precisely on participation of women in the justice sector as justice makers, as justice administrators. So the question perhaps, um, uh, Ms. Trumbich, you can help us develop a little bit this, uh, this question. How important is having women sitting in the right places to make sure that laws are reflective of a better uh, equality in the end? Thank you. Thank you, Laria. And in fact, this year, um, we have been undertaking a historical study of the laws and we now have a database covering 50 years of laws um, in the areas that we measure. And we did a correlation with women in parliament and gender equal, how gender equal their laws are. And we found a very strong positive correlation that where laws treat men and women more equally, there are more women in parliament. Now, we haven't established a causal link yet. It might be that when, when laws are more equal, 
women are more empowered and tend to seek office and go into more decision-making bodies. Or it could be that when women achieve those places, they legislate more equally. But certainly it's, con it's comforting to know that there is this link and we hope that with more research, we can actually identify where the causality goes. Thank you. And, uh, and again, we're very much looking forward to a new fresh research and data on this issue because it is, uh, I know that uh, 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 data doesn't point exactly to the causality, but there is a strong uh, sense and, and evidence, localized evidence that this is actually the case. So it would be great to analyze it more in depth. Um, we also have a question for Ms. Baleda. Um, as um, you are involved with the Philippine Commission on Women, um, how do we convince parliamentarians to prioritize laws that, um, uh, that foster, that, uh, that, that, that make, make us go in the direction of gender equality? We have so many uh, reform areas to work with, especially during COVID-19. So how do you uh, lobby parliaments to make uh, laws, uh, gender equality laws take the priority among so many other priority issues? Yeah, thank you for that very interesting question. Um, we in the Philippine Commission on Women usually work with champions on, of gender equality and women's empowerment. So first we identify who are our allies in both Congress House of Representatives and the Senate. And then given that, we try to convince others to support our cause and advocacy. So um, once uh, our legislators and policymakers are uh, informed and made to understand what our advocacy is all about, I, I think we are able to get some other support. Of course, we cannot, we, we cannot convince everyone, but as long as you have champions in both houses, I think that is very important, especially uh, on important committees with, which tackles uh, gender issues and women's concerns. Uh, it really matters that you have uh, some legislators there who are supportive of your cause and to help you um, push, I mean, help the Philippine Commission on Women push our agenda on gender, uh, gender equality and women's empowerment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Baleda. And we also have um, a question for Her Excellency Osna Jalil. Um, Karen uh, Faulkner uh, touched on the, the issue of ordinary women. Um, Her Excellency, you expressed so well how important it is to get the buy-in of, uh, of ordinary women around the world uh, to make sure that we have the uh, laws actually implemented in practice. So Karen is asking, is there anything that ordinary women around the world can do to advance the cause of achieving gender equality in law, um, even if they're not working for a government, for an organization, what can an ordinary woman do to help? Uh, before I jump in to answer this question, there are two, uh, I would say, statements I have to make. The first one is, I don't believe in the word ordinary because there is no ordinary, ordinary woman in the world. Either all of us are ordinary or none of us are ordinary because I have not met any woman, at least across this country that I'm living in and I'm, I'm raised and I'm working for. Any single woman that I've met, particularly in these two provinces that I am in the last two uh, days, all of them are extraordinary. If I would ever would like to compare them with the male uh, counterparts, like the struggles they have, the, um, the capacity they have, how hard they work, the talents they have, that that's extraordinary. The second one, uh, it's not just women to work for the women. I don't believe in that. Because this year, the narrative we are setting for Afghanistan is that every Afghan woman and men is supposed to work for the Afghan women. And the reason is because if we are talking about women having all the struggles in order to jump into another level for herself, we should not be so cruel in order to add something more to her plate. 
because they're already struggling in order to build their own capacity to, to create opportunities. Because in Afghanistan, I don't believe someone is giving a woman an opportunity. They're creating opportunities. So the reason is uh, that, that I'm saying that it's, it should not be women's job or women's mandate to work for other women. That is why we are setting this narrative for this year for Afghanistan. So what all the, I mean, the women in, in across the globe can work in order to help, I mean, each other across different countries. It, no matter if they're working in, in the government or not, I do believe deeply that it's okay that the governments are uh, responsible in order to develop national level policies, in order to develop laws, in order to work with the parliament for the approval of the law, or uh, I would say to create the foundation, the legal and policy level foundation and resource allocation for the uh, women, for the women's development. But at the implementation level, there are so much that all these women out of the government can do because all the implementation components will be outsourced to these women. So there will be a woman working, for a comp working on a complete different portfolio out, out of government, but even one voice is going to help a lot with the uh, implementation. So what the women can do across the globe is that they can join in different causes and they can raise. First, they can start raising their voice. Second, they can implement or they can practice those voices or those narratives or those, uh, I would say, policy uh, uh, policies, I would say, within their own institutions at a very small level. I do really believe in um, implementation or practicing different policies at a very uh, small level. And that is why I keep saying that if we are supposed to have male allies this year for Afghanistan, those male allies should not start with the girls or the mothers or the women of their neighbors. They should start within their own families. Otherwise, they're not male allies. Otherwise, they are not male champions. So what the women can do all across the world, not ordinary women, because all the women are extraordinary, um, they can raise their voice. They can implement those policies that we jointly agree with under their, their own um, uh, institutions. Plus, they can also help their female uh, colleagues in many ways, in changing mentality of another male colleague that are having good relationship with them towards a, a, another female colleague. They can, they can have many different means in order to make a better environment for their uh, female uh, colleagues within their uh, either colleagues or friend, if that's a social environment or someone acquaintance, they can do a lot at the practical level because that is the real essence of how we bring changes because the governments, they're the big umbrella. They can't do much. But it's exactly these women who can really do. But at the, uh, at the same time, I, I should not forget that they need to create male allies. If one woman can create one male allies, that, I mean, we are supposed to have a, a fantastic world for other women. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Her Excellency. And how true uh, that all women are extraordinary. We, we absolutely love your, uh, your comment on that. And, uh, um, and also, reminding us of the importance of joining forces all together, men and women for the same cause. And uh, so that's a, a, a very, very important point that you are raising there as well. Well, with many, many thanks to our first round of speakers, let me now move to introduce our second uh, set of distinguished speakers today who are going to help us um, uh, develop some, some of the questions that we uh, confront uh, during today's event. So here with us are uh, Ms. Catherine Megan, who is the General Counsel of IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development. We are also joined by Ms. M Melissa Upreti, uh, the Vice Chair of the UN Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls. Welcome. And we also uh, are very happy to have with us Dr. Leslie Ann Foster, who is the Executive Director of the Masi Maniane Women's Rights International and Chair of the Gender-Based Violence Forum, South African Women Lawyers Association. So a very warm welcome to our second set of speakers today. It's wonderful to have you with us. And uh, uh, Ms. Megan, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Botillero. I'm really honored to participate in such an engaging discussion today with such esteemed um, speakers, Her Excellency Jalil, Ms. Baleda, um, Ms. Trubik from the World Bank, 
And we have indeed been working um, very well across IDLO, World Bank, and IFAD, and delighted to um, join this discussion from Rome, where IFAD is based and where the United Nations food agencies are also based. You may know that IFAD is the only UN agency and international financial institution that's specifically mandated to invest in agriculture. And we reach the poorest and most vulnerable households in the developing world. We're the second largest investor in agriculture globally and finance smallholders and producers in what we call the last mile of the developing world. So really the most rural regions. Most of the households that we finance have an income of $2 or less a day. And I'm really proud that IFAD's projects generally double that income after only a few years. And since IFAD's inception in 1977, rural women and girls have been at the center of our work. In fact, across the 100 countries where we work, about half of the recipients of our financing are women, and gender is mainstreamed across our projects. I'd like to share with you today reflections on three points. The first is some statistics about gender inequality and the current she session. The second is what IFAD is doing to eliminate discriminatory laws on paper. And then thirdly, what we're doing to eliminate discriminatory laws in practice. And I can really relate with so many of the excellent comments by Her Excellency Jalil um, of, of things she shared with us in Afghanistan that we have IFAD are seeing similar things in practice across the globe where we invest and support um, women agri entrepreneurs. So let me start with a few statistics. At IFAD, we really see daily the need to heed the commission's call to strengthen women's voices and address poverty for rural men and women. So some pre-COVID statistics, 80% of the rural poor, of the poor live in rural areas. That amounts to 1.7 billion women and girls. You might not have known that women produce almost 50% of the world's food. That's five zero percent. Yet shockingly, less than 15%, one five percent have title to land. And when you look at accessing finance to support and grow their small businesses, globally, there's a 9% financing gap between men and women, and this is greatly exacerbated in the developing world and even more so in the rural areas where we work. But against these stark figures, I find it really inspiring that there's another figure, that women tend to invest three times more of their earnings in their families and in their communities than men do. This is a direct investment by women in health and education of their families and their children. And at IFAD, we see that our investments in rural women is investing not only in ending hunger and poverty today, but at the same time, it's investing in our children and in our future. Like my co-panelists, I am concerned how COVID is dramatically reversing gains made by women and girls worldwide. And what we're seeing as a she session, that is an economic recession that's disproportionately impacting women. On paper, we're working on many different levels at international law, um, reinforcing international law commitments like gender, like such as CEDAW through regular dialogue with our member states, at the national level on economic empowerment policies, at the community level in last mile, engaging communities and small cooperatives of women farmers, and at the household level, putting people into our projects. The challenge we see is that well, as Her Excellency Jalil said, you could have a very good thing on paper when you turn to practice, there are other challenges that come up. And today I'd like to focus on one particular topic IFAD believes can strengthen women's voices and address female poverty and that's financial inclusion. So let me turn to these challenges in practice. On paper, we've seen that women can face discriminatory or complex lending practices. These can include things like higher interest rates, um, strict collateral requirements for loans, um, 
availability of emergency credit, lack of basic insurance project products. And women can also be less likely to um, apply for financing due to lower financial literacy or credit history business plans. To address this, we focus support on financing and advisory services to enable women to reach the next um, level and, and have sustainable businesses. And I'd like to share two quick examples. One is in Benin, where COVID disrupted transport services for female farmers. These female farmers were subject to laws that made them have licenses to drive larger trucks or vehicles to bring their food to markets. Because this wasn't possible with the lockdown, we worked with an all women rice cooperative, about 6,000 processors and producers to enable them to access smaller three wheeled trailers with lower licensing requirements with helmets and license plates so that they themselves could bring their products to warehouses and markets. In the second example in India, in remote tribal areas, COVID made it impossible to access financial services during the pandemic. We helped women in these remote areas train to provide micro ATM services within their remote local communities to allow them to access basic financial services. This brought these services to these remote communities, but it also created an ecosystem of women who could make a commission for providing these financial services and start their own journey of entrepreneurship. And from these brief examples, I think we can see how IFIs and UN agents are positioned both on paper, but also in practice to engage holistically for women's empowerment and financial inclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Megan. Yeah, this is, these are very important points you raised. The whole issue of legislation of uh, land titling, natural resources in general, is really an essential one and is so much linked to women's economic empowerment and uh, access to financial resources, as you correctly pointed out. So uh, thank you for guiding us through this um, very important area of uh, financial inclusion and having the proper regulations to ensure that such inclusion is not just a principle, uh, a guiding principle, but it becomes a reality. Sometimes you need to uh, uh, dig down even below the, uh, the, the, the legislative level to really the small rules, regulations uh, that, that really apply to the micro level. So it's, it's a very painstaking work that IFAD is doing and we are all very, very grateful for that. Um, so thank you. And moving on to uh, Ms. Uh, Melissa Opreti, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. I'd like to start by really thanking you for the invitation uh, to join this uh, panel of extraordinary women and also to be able to address many extraordinary women in the audience, I'm sure, as well as men and other colleagues and allies and friends. Um, my name is Melissa Preti, and I'm vice chair of the UN Working Group on Discrimination Against women and girls, which is a special procedure of the Human Rights Council. Uh, the elimination of discriminatory laws to achieve substantive gender equality is at the core of our mandate. Since its inception in 2010, the Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls has really strived to advance gender equality and to develop progressive standards in a number of thematic areas through constructive dialogue with states and also extensive engagement with civil society and different institutions. Our main working methods include thematic reports which contain recommendations to states, country visits and communications through which we engage directly with states. Um, in my remarks, I'm going to tell you about how we see the world from our perspective as a mandate, what some of our concerns are as well as thoughts for the future. So coming to the present, we are deeply concerned that the COVID-19 pandemic has aggravated pre-existing and deeply entrenched inequalities and is negatively affecting the advancement of gender equality around the world. We've, also, we've already started seeing how gender equality is being rolled back. 
Now, um, many of the esteemed panelists have already highlighted concerns that we are also concerned about. Uh, they've talked about issues and gaps, so I won't reiterate those in the interest of time. But I will say that in the last 10 years, we have also documented many gains and obstacles, as well as good practices by states. And we have repeatedly expressed concern about a number of things, including the rising authoritarianism in governance, the uncontrolled pursuit of profit, multiple health and economic crises, and deepening inequality, as well as the politicization of religions, which all pose considerable challenges to securing substantive gender equality and the full realization of women's human rights. And these trends continue to shape the current context. Despite the progress that has been made in numerous areas of women's lives, we have identified in our reports and through our work, the persistence of a global discriminatory cultural construction of gender. And this is often tied to religion and the continued reliance of states on cultural justifications for adopting discriminatory laws and also failing to respect international human rights standards their own obligations under international law. So linked to this is the opposition of some states to the concept of intersectionality as well as gender. And we have repeatedly emphasized that discrimination against women and girls begins at home. And this must be tackled to ensure gender equality in all spheres. Throughout our work, we've also observed that women's sexual and reproductive rights are particularly under attack which is important to note because this affects women's participation in family life as well as in all other spheres, and it profoundly impacts their autonomy. Under COVID, we've noted many instances where states have contributed directly to violations of women's human rights. For example, by deeming certain reproductive health services as non-essential, by moving resources away from reproductive health services, and by creating new restrictions. This has effectively meant redirecting resources away from women and limiting their options to protect their health and lives. These policy decisions are inherently discriminatory. We remain deeply concerned about the intimidation, threats and violence faced by women human rights defenders, which is visible in every region of the world. The pandemic has also been exploited by some governments to escalate to new levels of authoritarianism under the guise of emergency regulations, thereby further militarizing societies, which always leads to further gender-based discrimination and violence. Despite the disproportionate impact of any and all crises on women, and COVID is no exception, their critical role in keeping communities running um, they are largely absent from local, national, and global COVID-19 response teams, policy spaces, as well as decision-making. Now, globally, women remain underrepresented in all branches of government, and the fact that they've been pushed out of the workforce in incredible numbers uh, really does not bode well for the future. That being said, it is important to note that in a few countries, women had, have led national responses which have recorded better outcomes and progress in terms of curbing the virus and its impact. Despite the pandemic, there are some governments that have actually reformed their laws, for instance, on abortion, which is one of the most damaging examples of the instrumentalization of women's bodies. And some have even ratified new treaties like the ILO Convention on Violence and Harassment that will help advance gender equality. Now, looking ahead to the recovery phase, um, it will be incumbent on governments to comply with their human rights obligations towards women and how women come out of the current crisis will indeed depend on their political choices. International financial institutions over which certain states have greater influence will critically shape the decisions made by developing countries in particular. If austerity is pushed and long, long-standing issues of systemic discrimination and gender-based violence are not fully addressed, women will be pushed further into another crisis. We believe that for legal guarantees of gender equality to benefit all women, implementation frameworks and strategies must take an intersectional approach that takes into account factors such as race, ethnicity, and age, among many others, and histories of discrimination, oppression, and exclusion must also be taken into account, as well as how these factors affect women throughout their life cycle. 
At the national level, as noted by some of the previous speakers, we also agree that national human rights institutions can play a crucial role in promoting measures to tackle systemic discrimination in the recovery phase. As we continue to fight against backlash, we also have to preserve our gains. And this is where we need the support of governments, because as we have seen, the more women make progress, the more intense is the resistance and the backlash to that progress. We will need to see a unified United Nations system to support these efforts with a coherent approach and a stronger focus on human rights. The COVID crisis is an opportunity to address structural inequalities and deficits that have consistently held women back and to reimagine and transform systems and societies. Feminists globally are already uniting across movements and borders to shape a collective and inclusive response to these circumstances, even when faced with violence and systemic discrimination, including from states. Civil society and feminist organizations must be supported in these efforts and with more resources as well as a seat at the table. Finally, the working group has been and will remain a strong ally for both governments as well as civil society and feminist organizations and movements in this crucial struggle. And on that note, I will end my remarks here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Upreti, is, uh, uh, for your very, very uh, insightful comments uh, and for uh, reminding us that uh, women's human rights are constantly under attack. And uh, we have seen that throughout uh, COVID-19 last year with uh, perhaps more visibility than before, but this has been a backlash that is ongoing now for, for several years, if not decades. And it's a constant struggle that we need to carry out to make sure that things are um, sometimes not even improved, but really they stay at, at, at a good level. Uh, acceptable level and this is so difficult and through your work uh, you are uh, obviously constantly in touch with the most difficult uh, si situations and, uh, uh, and and tangible backlash that uh, that is really ongoing against women so it's it's extremely important work and I'm sure I see already the the Q&A chat um, populated with a lot of interesting questions that we will uh, approach in a moment. But for now, let me give the floor uh, with great pleasure to Dr. Leslie Ann Foster. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> um, I would like to, to acknowledge this, the invitation here today and to thank everybody for giving me this opportunity. Um, achieving gender equality on paper and in practice during challenging times speaks to the challenges of the COVID pandemic, but needs the lens needs to be broadened to include, as our previous speaker said, other challenges such as the rise of nationalism, the capture of state institutions, um, the capture of states itself, and the subsequent rollback on human rights, uh, the human rights agenda, including gender equality. The recent actions of Turkey is a case in focus right now. COVID has made the inequalities more visible and given credence to push harder for a human rights approach to addressing the vulnerability of women and girls and the depoliticization of gender equality and violence against women and girls. I'm speaking from South Africa. My organization is a locally rooted and globally connected feminist organization working to advance gender equality. And I'm really speaking about the particular challenges that we are facing in this country um, in relation to customary law, because we have a dual system um, that operates in our country at the moment. South Africa has recorded a history of colonialism and apartheid, which were very, very um, oppressive towards women. Um, but since our, the dawn of our democracy, we have <clears throat> amongst the world's best um, constitutions in the world in which the equality principle is enshrined. Um, we have been uh, signatories to several regional and international instruments, including the CEDAW Convention. I just want to turn my camera down. Sorry, I don't know what's happened there. And um, so I want to speak about the Customary Marriages Act, in, in fact, because it is a law that affects almost 18 million rural people 
Um, and this is the largest number of people in our, in our society. Large sections of South Africa are rural women. So the um, Customary Marriages Act um, refers to African marriages. It's a dual system to the Civil Marriages Act. And it was, um, it, we, have, we changed the act in 1998 in order to protect women in customary marriages. This was previously not recognized at all. The constitution specifically mandates the enactment of legislation in you know, recognizing cultural and religious marriages, but cautions courts to develop customary law that upholds the spirit and intent of the Bill of Rights. The constitution clearly enshrines equality principles and guarantees non-discrimination on the basis of sex, pregnancy, marital status, etc. However, marriage is often the site of women's legal, social, economic, and sexual subordination. The recognition of customary marriages Act of 120 of 1998 aims to provide equal status and capacity of spouses in customary marriages and to regulate the propriety consequences of customary marriages. Previously, women and girls were relegated to lower status, um, standing within the marriage um, of two people. In analyzing the law, though, we should consider three elements. Um, that's the substance of the law, the structure of it, and the culture of the law. And often we overlook that there are these three elements um, and, and inequality can be embedded in either one of them. In terms of this particular uh, act, the Customary Marriages Act, um, it does stipulate that spouses should be 18 years or older, they should be consenting, that the marriage is negotiated, celebrated, and concluded, and both spouse, spouses then have equal status. There is, however, a worrisome caveat, which says that if the marriage includes a minor, parents may provide consent. Now, across Africa, we have this problem of child marriages, uh, which is, of course, uh, deeply problematic because minors are often married um, off. And during COVID, we saw that there was um, quite a number of young girls who were sent home from the um, arranged marriage families because of food insecurity. And when they returned to their family homes, they were sent away for the very same reason. So this form of discrimination that happened was, was very problematic for us. Um, so the law also allows for polygamy. The Customary Marriages Act allows for polygamy. Um, this contravenes, of course, the CEDAW Convention. Um, men are allowed several marriages and women aren't. And this means that women are then vulnerable to both violence and HIV infection in our society. They also have uh, problems around inheritance and maintenance. What we saw during COVID was that when spouses died, women again were evicted from their homes and were denied inheritance and maintenance rights. So this is around the, the, the substance of the law. In the structure of the law, um, the Customer Marriages Act requires that um, it be registered at the court within three months to make it legal. Quite often women do not know about this, especially if they're very young, they have no information um, and the husbands are reluctant to do it. And this prejudices the woman if the man dies or in the case of divorce. So in terms of the structure of the law, we've noted that lawyers, courts, traditional authorities apply their own interpretations of the law. Cultural biases by police and judges can impact negatively on the rights of women. There's also weak enforcement of the Customary Marriages Act in some communities all of which com compromises women's access to justice. So in terms of the culture of the Customary Marriages Act, existing social norms prevail in spite of the provisions of the Constitution and its embedded Bill of Rights. In traditional and cultural settings, equality is an elusive concept, one which is not being embraced, much less promoted. The interpretation of the Customary Marriages Law is based on notions of what is appropriate for women and men within those settings. The issue of lobola or bride price um, is another discriminatory practice that is actually widely embraced, but also renders the women vulnerable to all kinds of violence. There have been some significant successes in case law taken to court, where biases have been challenged, where the validity of sections of the act were challenged on the grounds of being in conflict with the principles of equality and in conflict with guarantees within the constitution. However, during COVID, a big push 
has got, been made by parliamentarians to pass what is known as the traditional courts bill. The rural South Africans are being systematically stripped of a few residual assets they managed to hold on to because Parliament has created this parallel and separate legal system that denies 18 million people the right to access South Africa's mainstream courts. The traditional courts bill is in its final stages of enactment. Women's groups have courageously challenged the uh, bill for 18 years, but all of a sudden it has been um, it is going to go through the final stages of adoption now. Uh, this is also political. The government wants in the local elections coming up shortly to have the support of traditional leaders um, in the voting process. And so the, the, this recognizes the traditional courts and the traditional leadership. And this is why the legislation is being pushed through now. The, it's a deeply flawed legislation and it is already being challenged in the constitutional court. So civil society groups um, are determined that we will resist the kind of inequality that comes through our legal systems, but it is a consistent, persistent struggle that we have to engage in. Um, we do have uh, also very strong recommendations from the CEDAW committee to look at a single family code and to address these issues of the inequalities within this particular legislation. And we will continue to be working to ensure that women are treated equally within our society, but it is a long game. It is not something that is going to happen and easily and needs to be supported in, 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 a, in many different ways. We saw during um, COVID that the, the inequalities that we said led to many vulnerabilities of women. You know, the job losses we've spoken about, uh, the lack of access to educational opportunities. And something we haven't spoken about is that we had this opportunity to meet and to discuss issues, but many of the women that we are trying to, to work and support haven't got access, they're digitally uh, illiterate, digital, they suffer from digital poverty and cannot access these kinds of platforms. So it's something that we need to keep in mind as we do this very important work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Foster, and uh, and thank you for highlighting the important connection uh, between um, customary law and uh, um, and formal uh, laws, if we want to call them like that. This is a, a, an interplay that is absolutely essential in ensuring uh, gender equality in law and in practice. Uh, and it's an issue that here at Idea Law we have been following for many years, uh, including um, how to uh, the, the question how to better and meaningfully engage with customary systems. So it's, uh, it, it's an issue that absolutely needs a lot of attention. Um, now we have um, a few minutes left in our, um, in our conversation. It's so interesting and we have so many questions. So let me immediately um, uh, pose a, a question to uh, Ms. Uh, Catherine Megan. There are several questions related to financial inclusion. Uh, this is an issue that has generated a lot of attention in our audience and um, uh, especially the question of digitalization. We are all talking about how to harness digitalization to basically move um, uh, from uh, away from the traditional barriers that uh, uh, women face uh, in approaching markets. So uh, we were just wondering, many colleagues were wondering, how is e IFAD tackling this issue of uh, digitalization? Uh, in order to support women, especially the most marginalized. Thank you. Um, we see that digitalization is a huge opportunity that is coming from the very uh, concerning crisis um, in the she session that really is a result of the COVID global medical pandemic that's turning into a global food and economic pandemic as well in many of the areas that we work. Yet in every crisis, there's opportunity. And one major opportunity we see for women is that development can harness and really open opportunities of financial inclusion for women. So for example, many women, um, as I've said, have 
is significantly less access to financial resources than, than men. In a traditional society, they may not be able to leave their homes, um, have someone watch their children to go to a physical bricks and mortar bank to apply for a loan, to take out credit, um, to inquire about insurance products. Now that everyone is at home, provided that we can have community-based access to technology, for, for example, Wi-Fi, et cetera, there's a much broader, more equitable access to financial products and financial services. And so we've been working really on the ground in rural areas, for example, to provide technology access, um, for example, in a community center, in the center of a cooperative of women that we've been working with for many years, so that they would have one access point um, and, and be trained on digitalization and access to finance. So that's one thing we've been doing is putting laptops and tablets in the hands of rural women farmers and cooperatives in very rural areas and training them through technical assistance and advisory capabilities on what type of access to finance they can have. Another thing we've done is, for example, in the Benin, in the India project, we actually empowered those women in these indigenous rural communities to become financiers in their tiny communities by giving them um, basically mini ATM services and, and posts so that they could um, provide finance to others in their community. So these are some of the innovative ways that we're trying to harness digitalization to provide more equitable access to finance for those who really for decades have been without it, the, right. the poor rural women farmers. Right. No, absolutely, and thank you. Uh, these these are excellent examples, and uh, and we know that IFAD is uh, is fully engaged in uh, in these uh, efforts. Um, I have many many questions for Melissa. Um, at least a dozen of comments or questions on the need for countries to sign on the ILO Convention 190. Uh, so really strong, the audience is really uh, wants to hear a strong statement on, on that. But um, because this is, I, I'm going to pose to you a more difficult question, <laughs> which is um, <laughs> how does the, um, the working group see the issue of having a new treaty for example, a new binding treaty explicitly on ending violence against women and girls. We have seen recently even the withdrawal of uh, key member parties from uh, essential treaties. So if you can give us a snapshot in really two minutes maximum of how the, um, the committee, the, the working group sees the question of new treaties versus old treaties and uh, the treaty uh, adoption and participation. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that question. I think with regards to um, a new treaty, violence against women is, of course, a pervasive global problem. It's been recognized now more as a, you know, a pandemic in itself. It's something that women's rights activists have been fighting against since the last three decades. We fought for the recognition of women's rights of, as human rights back in the 90s. Our predecessors for, have been fighting since the 70s and 80s. We also fought for the recognition of violence against women as a human rights violation. So this is part of an ongoing struggle. I think the most important question is really uh, about implementation, though. We do have a lot of core treaties. We have specific treaties. We have some new treaties, including the ILO Convention on Violence and Harassment, which is incredibly progressive in terms of its language. And we have called for its ratification in our most recent thematic report on women's human rights in the changing world of work. I think uh, we need to have much stronger uh, discussion about what implementation means and what are the challenges to implementation, how can we implement all the treaties that we have as we continue to think about whether a new treaty might be warranted. I think we have a lot of tools of, at our disposal and as many of the uh, panelists today have also pointed out and we totally agree as a mandate that the lack of implementation, the lack of political will, the, um, the still the, the inadequacy, I think um, the lack of broad-based consensus, social consensus, that discrimination and violence are human rights violations and they have to stop. That's where I think we have to build more support and we have to build strategies that will help us operationalize what we have as we think about what else we might need in addition to the treaties and the guarantees that we have. 
Thank you so much, Melissa. Uh, it's uh, um, it, it, again, it, it's the issue of implementation has emerged during this panel as really the core one. So I think we can all agree with your point and uh, and, and focus on what makes a difference really at the at the local level, at the national level, and in changing the attitude towards uh, norms in general. Um, so with that, uh, we are uh, coming to the close of our webinar, and uh, I would like to really sincerely thank our panelists, our wonderful panelists, for an excellent discussion today. It has been very, very rich and uh, uh, much appreciated. Uh, your insights have uh, brought a lot of uh, uh, clarity and, uh, and a fresh perspectives also to an issue that remains central to our uh, quest for gender equality. So I would like to thank the co-organizers as well, and uh, we will continue our collaboration. Uh, it's a pleasure to have been here with you today on behalf of uh, IDLO and of our Director General, Jen Beagle. Um, a warm thank you and have a great continuation of CSW. Thank you for being with us today and goodbye. Thank you, Will.